Welcome back to the Pathmakers Podcast. I have a very exciting guest today, Quinn Hansen uh, from Bend, Oregon. Now, Quinn, thank you for taking the time out of your day and coming on. Yeah, I appreciate the invite. Uh, you know, it's always fun to to have the opportunity to to have these kinds of conversations. And so, you know, just the fact that I get to be here right now is really exciting. And so, you know, Edwin, thank you to you for uh, putting this together. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. But you know, for those of you who don't know you, Quinn, who is Quinn Hansen? If you could give a little introduction. Yeah, it, it, happy to try to give a somewhat coherent answer to that. I think um, so. Locally in Bend, I you know, kind of tag myself as the bend search guy, so to speak. I, I spend my days working with this recruiting business, helping companies around here hire people. But outside that area, I've always had this interest in, um, you know, what I guess what you could call side projects, side hustles, small bets, kind of whatever the term tends to be. Um, you know, you and I got connected through this small bets community. And so outside mm -hmm. of just, you know, this day job of, of kind of consulting and helping businesses hire people, I like to just kick off different types of projects and, and things that I think would be fun to do. And so this all kind of started a couple of years ago. I actually wrote a, um, I think it was a series of blog posts about kind of industrial engineering, which is what my undergrad degree was in, which is really just the fancy way to say, uh, you know, process improvement. Industrial engineering is basically the science of how you make stuff better. And so I, I turned a few different blog posts into this book that I called the pockets, the pocket guide to making stuff better which I threw up on online and on Gumroad. And really the intent there was to basically just break down some of these tools in this field that nobody's heard of industrial engineering and make it really accessible. And so it meant it was meant to basically just be this quick thing uh, to read through. And, and so that I thought was a lot of fun to go through just to figure out like, how do you actually write a book? How do you publish a book? How do you get something onto, you know, Amazon's KDP profile? How do you actually make money from stuff on the internet? And so, that kind of sparked these other projects that I've done really just based on things I've been interested in. And so, you know, outside of work and, you know, the professional thing, I've been an ultimate Frisbee player for like 15 years now. And you always run into these same issues on an ultimate Frisbee team where you're trying to get this group of 20 some odd people to be able to work together as a team. And, and there's not a ton of info on ultimate the way, the way there is on football and baseball and hockey, right? There is no, 50 year track record of incredible ultimate frisbee teams the way there is for all these other sports and so you know figured i'd take the same idea of making a small bet and put together this kind of guide on ultimate frisbee for captains of teams that are trying to figure out how to get all these people on the same page to perform well as a team and then you know there are a couple other things i've thrown together um you know hats stickers things we've made um just kind of for fun and um so I don't know if I can summarize that. Maybe I am a, a you know an industrial engineer by training, a, you know entrepreneur at heart, and I spend my days right now running a recruiting business. So there's a lot all at once. Yeah, no, I, I look. I took a look at your gum road, and I was like, wait, there's like a hat here. There's something about ultimate here, and then there's like, well, like like the pocketbook for like resume, pocketbook for you know like the industrial engineering stuff. I thought it was really cool, honestly, like seeing all that stuff there. Yeah, and, you know, maybe this is cheesy, but I think I've taken a little inspiration out of Kevin Kelly, who is you know kind of known in certain internet circles as being the most interesting man in the world because he's you know author, he's a photographer, he makes AI art, he's a like a entrepreneur. He's just he's gone down this rabbit hole. Or maybe I should say he's gone down like a thousand rabbit holes to just kind of do whatever he felt like doing. Whereas, you know, maybe the traditional advice is like, do one thing, get really good at one thing, just go all in on one thing. And, I, you know, I think I'm too distracted for that. Like, right, there's just too much else in the world to do and to be interested in to, to just do one thing. And so I, I like that Kevin Kelly approach, I think of do whatever you're interested in. I mean, that's that's kind of like what I think, you know, the small bits community, like uh, as, as the whole is kind of like, you know, kind of like roll the dice sort or more or less and kind of like focus on one thing, but not too long. Cause you know what, I, I th sometimes I think about this, you know, going back to your point, not to focus on one thing. It's like, well, what if you were the best, um, the computers back in the day, you, they use like the hole puncher thing. What if you were the best like hole puncher? Where, where, where are those hole punchers now? <laughs> yeah. It's risky. Yeah. And you know, it's, um, you know, I think in every economics, you know, kind of 101 class, they'll talk about how this, you know, 
expertise in a certain area leads to productivity for everybody. Because if you're the winemaker, then you make the wine. And if I'm the sock maker, I make the socks and everybody benefits because you can make wine more cheaply and I can make socks more cheaply. And then the first criticism was always, well, like, well, what if we don't want wine anymore? What if we don't want socks anymore? What if we don't have your thing hmm. anymore? Then that one specialty is out the window. Yeah, yeah, basic. Yeah, I mean, in, 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 in short, yeah, that's basically true. And I guess one thing I'm kind of curious about is industrial engineering, right? You touched it how it's kind of like making processes better. Industrial engineering as a whole, is it kind of, and I'll, you'll see what this leads to in a second, is it kind of like a general thing or does it specialize processes of, you know, XYZ business? Yeah, so. It started, I think, in a more traditional manufacturing setting and has migrated into much more general high level business practices. Um, so bet, like the field of industrial engineering basically came out in the late 1800s. There were a couple of mechanical engineers that I, honestly, I think they were building like brick walls and the way they did it is they would carry bricks from like this one pile of bricks out to wherever the wall was. and it was just this like weird back and forth where you got to go pick up bricks and then you got to move the bricks and then you got to stack the bricks and blah, blah, blah. And someone thought, well, like, what if we put these things on wheels and we just wheel the bricks to where we want them? And then someone was like, well, what if we make the thing move? So when you're on the ground, you know, your bricks are on the ground, but as you start getting higher on this wall, you can like, you know, have this thing that's holding your bricks move up as well. So you're not constantly like bending over and trying to pick up bricks and stuff. And long story short, um, once you got into more of like the early 1900s and the manufacturing and, you know, the Henry Fords of the world started trying to figure out how to do a lot of stuff really fast. You started to get more people focused on just like, how do we take this process and make it simple and make it smooth and make it repeatable? Uh, and then again, throughout like the fifties, sixties, it became a really big deal at Toyota. And so a lot of the tools that you might see in industrial engineering came out of the Toyota manufacturing group. And then it was in like the eighties and nineties that people started to really take it to a whole nother level. So a lot of people might be familiar with like six Sigma, which is kind of this mathematically or statistically backed process improvement tool where you'll look for like defects, so to speak, and then try to figure out how you fix those defects. And I think it was somebody at like Motorola or at a call center at one point started trying to use this analysis to basically say, Hey, if we've got a million phone calls happening with a million customers, how do we document this? How do we make it easy for all these people to handle all these phone calls? And then, you know, Jack Welch, I think from GE implemented a lot of six Sigma and process improvement type stuff to make the business run more effectively. And just over the last, however many years, it's really migrated into everything from, people management to project management to like ergonomics is one of the weird fields that kind of came out of this. So like, you know, how do you set a desk up so you can actually be functional at it? Or, you know, if you have to manufacture something, how does somebody that's five feet tall versus somebody that's six feet tall, how do they do the same thing? And ergonomics is basically the field that developed here to create like mobile desks and adjustable desks. And so it's, it's become this really gen like general toolkit that blends basically engineering people management and like business together to figure out how to make stuff better okay. i don't know if that answered your question at all but you know <laughs> i think i think that kind of did and like uh, where i kind of want to lean that like focus to is you know the book you have like the main one it's um the pocket book for let me pull it up i forget the exact name but the pocket it's a guide to making stuff better yeah, the pocket to make stuff better. And I think what you like that whole entire thing that I think we just talked about was kind of like the history of the component. So I was reading like the description. You mentioned um, history, service, operations, and like people. Those are kind of like the main four like sections or like themes in the book, right? How, I guess, could you touch more on that? Yeah. So I, I think um, so in, in any business, as you're trying to, grow it, trying to scale it, trying to make it last a long time, you run into all of those types of problems. There are, you know, there's people problems where you got to figure out how to get the people to, to work together. There are process problems where you've got to figure out how to just like, how to manufacture a thing, how to make the trinket or the widget. There are uh, 
you know, the implementation problems were like, hey, if we've got this idea on how we could make this thing better, how do we actually implement it? Like you just run into all those issues. And so industrial engineering kind of focuses, I don't know if you can even say focus, but it covers a lot of that. And so there's, you know, back in, I think the fifties or sixties, there was this woman named Mary Parker Follett, who was a social worker. And she worked with these poor communities and like worked with nonprofits and worked with different types of um, like social causes. Uh, And what she realized at one point is that people have these really porous personalities where in a certain team, they might behave a certain way, but a certain other team or in a certain setting, they might behave another way. And she ended up pivoting away from social work and into management consulting because she took that expertise on like how people fit together as a team and started going to work for these large businesses that were like, Hey, I have 10,000 employees. What do I do with all of this? And so she would go into like the people analysis side of things to figure out like, okay, Hey, if you're an expert in this, you're an expert in that, you're an expert in this other thing. Like how do we fit you all together? It's like a puzzle almost to make you all productive and make you all functional make you all like enjoy the thing you're doing, be productive at it. And then also like help everybody win. And so that's, you know, that's kind of the people side in a nutshell. Uh, you know, there's a joke, I think it's Michigan State or the University of Michigan, one of those industrial engineering programs has this quote hanging up on the wall that says engineers make stuff, industrial engineers make stuff better. And so like, you know, one of the examples that you make, like, you know, we try to pull out of real time here is the Tesla just rolled out their cyber truck. And it's this, you know, it's, it's got these crazy angles into it. It's like cold rolled steel that they're building this out of. And the feedback from a lot of these first customers is that the panels don't fit together, right? So if you've got, you know, these things that are supposed to get together like this, but they're coming out like this. And, and so, you know, theoretically some engineer designed that, or, you know, these designers built that car and now you've got this whole process to put the thing together. And so an industrial engineer at Tesla might go into that manufacturing line and say, okay, Hey, here's how we're putting everything together let's do an an analysis of this and figure out what exactly is happening. And so we can close that gap. And so you you get that very literal industrial engineer, right? They're in the industry, they're in the manufacturing line, trying to figure out how do you make that stuff better? Uh, And so, yeah, you got the people, you've got the, like the manufacturing side. And then again, I'm like, again, this whole system level, like if you're Tesla, if you're some business that's got a hundred departments or you've got tons of departments, like, generally you want that all to operate and fit together smoothly. And so industrial engineering can kind of fit into that space as well to just figure out what exactly are we, you know, what resources are we using in this department? What resources are we using in that other department? And is there overlap here that we can like help each other learn from each other? Can we share these resources? Can we make like the resource pool like fit everybody? And, And so it's really hard to talk about, I think at a general level. And so, you know, if we make this more specific, you know, maybe we pick on Apple, for example, like the CEO of Apple, Tim Cook, his undergrad degree is industrial engineering. And he started his career on the supply chain side of things. And so he basically helped businesses figure out how do they get their stuff from a raw material place to a processing plant? And then how do you get the processing plant to manufacture the thing and then produce the the end result? Uh, so he started doing that with a company called Compaq, I think, which doesn't really exist anymore. And then he joined Apple in something like 1998 as the VP of supply chain, something like that. And one of the things he did really early on, somewhere in like that 2003 to 2005 window, is he basically bought an entire supply chain for memory for iPods. And then when they launched the iPod product and started to build that in the early 2000s, they had a guaranteed supply of memory effectively because Tim Cook had locked that in. Uh, you know, one of the other big pushes he had was, you know, people were confused on how to use Apple products and they were still kind of this niche thing in the mid 2000s. And so when they would go to Best Buy or Fry Electronics and try to ask about iPods, nobody could help him because no, like it was still this niche product. And so he created the genius bar, which is what you see in, uh, in Apple stores. Now, I think for the best buys that still exist, you can go in there and see the, the genius bar. And so he created that line, just kind of customer service, kind of tech. Um, 
to support those products, right? And then obviously over the last however many years, he you know he took over as the CEO in 2011 or 12 and has just built an absurdly gigantic business um, through some of these things, right? Process optimization, through supply chain management, through people operations. Um, and a lot of that comes through, you know, the industrial engineering background. And then he did go on to do an MBA at some point in like the 90s, maybe. Um, and so I'm sure he got a lot out of it from there. But like industrial engineering is just like this big toolkit to help solve like those big business problems. Hmm. I guess, you know, that I think, you know, works super great. I like, you know, the larger business. Is there kind of like anything that you would say is like applicable to say someone, you know, who maybe doesn't have 10,000 employees, right? Maybe they have like two employees. Maybe it's just them. Is it, it's kind of like, is there some things, maybe it's like a mindset or maybe it's, you know, something, something theoretical that, you know, that world can sort of play into, I guess, you know, a smaller pond, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the guys that came out of Toyota or worked for Toyota for a long time was named Taiichi Ono. And one of the frameworks he developed there that I think is really applicable in kind of any business is what he called the eight sources of waste. And really what that was, was this list of things to uh, try to identify within your business and then eliminate them. And so, you know, this started on the manufacturing side of things. And so one of the things they would look at is like, okay, are we overproducing anything that we should just not be doing anymore? Right. So if your work resources are going into building, say like 10,000 widgets, or even if your work resources are going into doing something that's not actually useful, then like stop doing that thing. And he goes on through this list to define a couple things, right? Are we moving stuff around? Are we redoing things too frequently that we shouldn't have to redo? And so from a small business perspective, one of the easy things to do is say, like, just look at, are you redoing anything, right? You know, do you have to, does the same customer call you twice to ask the same questions because you didn't answer them appropriately the first time or because they didn't get it or something wasn't communicated, right? So if you're ever redoing something, there's a really easy opportunity to usually look at that and try to figure out why are we redoing this and how do we make sure we don't redo it. Uh, and so that'd be a really easy, uh, like quick one any small business could do. Uh, in the, you know, let's say like quality, for example, every business says that they want to produce something that's a high quality. But that's one of those concepts that's like pretty nebulous. It's not super well defined. And so what is high quality? Well, there's the, um, there's a series of tools that have come out of the industrial engineering world. You know, the um, uh, there's the Ishikawa diagrams. There's the um, uh, like the QFD house, um, like basically these different matrix. There's this framework called ServQual that is basically like how do you determine quality? Uh, and again, you can take some of those ideas and say, okay, if I'm a you know maybe I'm a little restaurant, maybe I'm a food truck, um, right? Maybe I've got a little business like that, and I want to make sure it's high quality. Well, you can go through this list of, um, you know, kind of the serve qual, or you can go through these quality exercises to say, okay, what is it that we are defining as quality? Is it the food presentation? Well, let's look at what we're doing. Are we putting our, you know, our food out on a crappy styrofoam plate that we got at some like wholesale store? Are we putting them out in like a nice little basket? Is it, you know, is it a pizza that's coming out on a solid metal tray? Uh, like things like that. You can start looking at the presentation. Uh, you know, then there's obviously the food itself, right? Are you send in a burger out that is sloppy but put together and it's got, you know, too much sauce all over it. It's just a big mess. Or does it, does it look like you put the thing together with some care? Uh, right. And so again, you can take that kind of idea of quality and try to back into like, what does your business do? What is the quality? And a lot of times too, the answer is like, well, talk to your customers. What do they value? What do they think? quality means and uh, right so if you've got a small business really doing anything to continue growing you generally need to double down on the things your customers want because they're the ones that are giving you the money right <laughs> and so uh, so a lot of times you know the answer might be something like hey ask two or three of your customers or 10 of your customers however many you have access to like what does high quality in this service look like? Or what does high quality in this product look like for you? You know, headphones, right? I've got a pair of AirPods in, there's Bose, there's a million different headphones out there. And so what makes a quality headphone? Is it the price? Is it the durability? Is it the reliability, right? Do they actually connect to your phone or your computer when you want it to? Uh, 
you know, there's any number of things you could unpack in this quality uh, page, basically, to, to try to figure out, like, what do you focus on? I mean, I think those are good points, right? You know, like any business can focus on quality and, you know, cutting out like unnecessary waste. And I, like I was thinking about myself, like there probably are things that like even in a digital environment where I think, you know, a lot of people, you know, nowadays they're making courses or maybe they're making, you know, these other like small things online, websites or whatever. I, I think there's still, correct me if I'm wrong, by the way, or like what your thoughts on this is, you know, there's still, there might be some sort of like digital waste of some sort, like maybe not necessarily them typing too much, but maybe like some sort of like time spendage, like time management or, or something else. There is honestly, if I, so I'm not a software developer, uh, but one of these ideas that I always think about that I want is a, um, is almost like a spell check type function, but that will recognize things that could be URLs and find them for you. So if you want to insert a URL into text in an email, Right. You have to basically start typing this email, say, you know, hey, Edwin, check out this Reddit post I just found. Um, and then you got to go to Reddit and find the post and then like embed the link. And it, it's this process where you got to like leave your email window, find mm -hmm. the link, copy the link, come back to your e email window, paste it in. And I think it'd be really hard to do for something like an Instagram post or a YouTube video where you've got this hyper specific link. But if I wanted to email you someday and just be like, hey, man. I found this business that I think you should know about. Check out, you know, Edwin's website dot domain. Theoretically, you could come up with some tool that would read that and say, oh, you know, maybe this should be a link to Edwin's website dot domain. Um, right. And so I don't know how you do that. I'm not a software developer, but like spell check works, obviously. Grammarly works where it can read a sentence and then, uh, you know, interpret it and be like, hey, did you actually mean this instead of that? Um, right? Should this be ing instead of ly? Um, right? So there's, there's code that exists for grammar and for spelling. And so I think it would be totally possible, again, not a developer. But I think that's one of those areas that that would be possible um, to just save a lot of time and like writing emails. Uh, <laughs> other than that, though, you know, once you get into the like data center world of all of the bits flying through there. I'm sure there are tons of ways you could look at how things move around. And I, like, I don't play in that space day to day. And so I don't have an answer, but um, I certainly think there, there are probably a ton of opportunities. For sure. For sure. And, and talking about the space that you do play around, I kind of want to shift focus on this ops combinator. <laughs> so like what, what is ops combinator? Yeah, so it's a play on the Y Combinator. Um, so Paul Graham started this thing back in the early or mid 2000s called Y Combinator, which is a startup accelerator program. And in the world of software development, there is a, I guess you would call it a tool, maybe a piece of code you can write called a Y Combinator. That is a function that calls on other functions. And so Paul Graham and his wife, I think, um, or I forget the entire group, they started this thing called Y Combinator, though, as a startup accelerator. They were basically a function that worked on other functions, I think is kind of the story. But in my head, I always thought, you know, what if you had an operation that worked on other operations? And really what that is, is like private equity, right? You're a business that goes out and buys businesses. And so in my head, Ops Combinator is just this play on words of, a, you know, an op or like a, an operation that works on other operations. And so the thinking behind this is really like, okay, if you take these industrial engineering tools, you pair that with a bunch of money in like a private equity fund, you can go buy businesses that are maybe struggling to scale or they've at, they're just at a point where they've got to figure out some people problem or some operation problem. And then you can, you know, acquire the business or, you know, acquire half the business apply some of the industrial engineering tools and then help that business run more effectively or scale or solve whatever issues. And then theoretically, everybody at that company wins because they can have more sales, have more revenue, operate a little bit more smoothly. And then this private equity fund would win because they've obviously get, they get a return on the investment. Right. And so that's where that started. And honestly, when I, I think I maybe said this earlier, maybe I didn't, um, when I first went online to start putting out, like thoughts on industrial engineering and blogs and stuff like that. Ops Combinator was just a website that I, I did that through. 
Yeah. yeah. So it, I guess is the future is so. So I guess this is one thing I, I want to make some clarification on this. So Ops Combinator is not a fund in and of itself. It, it's more of a blog. No, it's just a blogging website. Yeah. And honestly, I, I really I haven't been on it now in a few months because it's one of those weaknesses of mine. It's, it's hard to consistently put out content on a website, right? It, it, whether it's blogging or tweeting or just doing any one thing consistently is really hard to do. And so kudos to everybody that does that. Right, right. And like, I, I think you mentioned like, like, right, consistency and like that, th this might be kind of like funny, but like, maybe that might be something you know, in the industrial engineering world, manufacture some way to like, force consistency you may not force consistency right but like make non-consistent things more consistent i guess yeah and so i wonder if there is a way like especially when it comes to using a computer you could almost you know pair some kind of a you know like a chat gpt type ai function that that can interpret a goal right and you could maybe give chat gpt this goal that says hey i want to publish a blog post every day or you know three times a week or whatever and then automate some rules that basically say, Hey, like when you open up your internet browser, we're going to block you from doing anything other than writing content in this little text window. It, like, does that work? Maybe, maybe not. Right. There's always workarounds for those things, right? There are all kinds of websites you can use to basically block Reddit or block YouTube or block Facebook. Yeah. Uh, right. To try to minimize your distractions. But ultimately, like if you want to get to those websites, you're just going to figure it out. And so <laughs> I bet there is a way you could do that though. Like, you know, if you've got some goal that's like, hey, I want to lose 10 pounds, you plug that into your web browser. And every time you open up a, you know, a tab on, you know, your Chrome or Safari browser have the little, you know, maybe it's the paperclip comes back, right? It, it pops up and says, hey, did you walk 10,000 steps yet today? Hey, have you done some pushups? Have you, you know, have you eaten a healthy meal today? Have you, uh, you know, did you do this thing that you said you were going to do, right? And just like a little push notification reminder. Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely true. And you know, with consistency, this is, I think is a really impressive, honestly, like going back to your book, like it's a book, like how many people actually write like a, a whole thing in their lifetime? Like that yeah, seems like I, really impressive. Oh, well. <laughs> thank you. I am, um, you know, this all, so it was summer of 2020 when I, I put this whole thing together. And so it, um, it worked out that I was not fully employed at the time i i had some time you know <laughs> um right summer 2020 like peak pandemic we didn't yeah. i don't even think we had mask mandates yet there were no vaccines nobody had any idea what was going on and, and so i was just at home all the time and uh, you know wasn't wasn't much else to do and so it was kind of a fun thing to go through because you know at the time it was really a thought exercise to really just revisit like how do you how, how do you write about these kinds of nebulous tools, right? It's, it's maybe one thing to be like, Hey, you could, you know, map the value stream of your business, but how do you put that all in writing and how do you make that accessible to people that have never heard of a value stream map? And, you know, when you've got a full-time job and other stuff to do that, it becomes much harder to, to maintain that consistency. And, you know, personally, it's probably some combination. I mean, I just need to not have anything else to do. You can't <laughs> be consistent in 10 things. <laughs> I guess you uh, there's two two things arise from that. A, I, I'll, I'll start with with the first one since you know we're still kind of like a little bit on the book topic. How did you approach, I guess, breaking the book down, but also breaking it down to be accessible? That was, that was the main thing. Like, you know, industrial engineering from what I've heard so far, like sounds awesome. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff to learn about industrial engineering. It seems like. And so how did you think about at least, you know, maybe breaking that book down into like sections that make sense, but also making it accessible to people who you know, don't have an industrial engineering background? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, um, so, you know, the process I think I went through here is I, I initially wrote down, I think a list of basically 50, you know, kind of tools or 50 chapter titles or 50 kind of ideas that I thought would be worth writing about, right? Um, and so for that, you know, for some examples, it was like, you know, Six Sigma could be fun to write about or um, spaghetti mapping, which is another tool or value stream mapping, or, you know, using this thing called A3 reporting, which is just a, you know, a way to report on a project using a piece of paper that's really big, right? Like an A3 piece of paper is like a, 
11 by 17 or something, right? So mm-hmm. anyways, I, I, I wrote this long list of things that I thought would be worth trying to write about. And then from there, I basically tried to pare it down to be like, okay, if this is pretty similar to that, then that's one tool, not two tools. Or if this and that are the same thing, then it's probably the same thing. And, you know, with Six Sigma, I was like, okay, is a book about statistics really accessible? Like, not really. Do I want to write a book about statistics? Absolutely not. Um, it, it, so from there, it just became this process of elimination. Like, okay, am I really interested in writing about that? No, right? And so in Six Sigma's case, I touch on it through a couple little pieces here and there in the book to give some high level idea of like what it means. Um, but then from there, I just try to break down things that would be like be easier, easy to digest. And so it ended up being, I think there's 39 separate tools that I write about in, you know, basically a chapter, a piece and tried to think about it in terms of like, what I wanted to create was basically the, the spark or the, the intro to the tool as opposed to a really in-depth guide. I wasn't writing a textbook. I didn't want to write some thousand page thing. And so I thought about how do I take this idea of, you know, value stream mapping and just write about this in a couple hundred or a couple thousand words. And since this is all, you know, the written format, you can use images, you can use all those things. And so I basically just tried to create like, an example of what a value stream map is, which is basically this, you know, you think, think about it like as a process map of your business where you've got a customer here that says, you know, Hey, Edwin, I'd like to buy the thing you make, right. I'd like to subscribe to your list. Okay, great. Now what happens? Right. And so then you've got this next step in value stream map, which is like someone takes this order and they do, they do something with it. Maybe the sales team, calls the engineering team or the engineering team calls the supply chain team or whatever. You, you basically can create this map of how does a customer place an order? What happens? What happens next? What happens next? How do you deliver this to your customer? And so that's the really cheesy version of a value strip map. And so I try to take that idea and basically just say, okay, how does this become accessible to anybody? And for, I really just started with like definitions, right? So there's, here's what it is. Here's what you're trying to create. Here are what these words mean. Here is what the value is at the end of the day is you can get this really clear picture of where are the resources going? How much time are we spending on this? Uh, And so theoretically at the end of this chapter, you will actually be able to look back and be like, okay, great. I have some idea of how my business functions from a value stream map perspective. And I could actually go to work tomorrow and start to create this. And ultimately, If you're a manager or you're a production um, supervisor or something, um, right? If you work in a business and you read this chapter on value stream maps and you actually want to go value stream map your business, the next step is honestly like Google it. And like there are other books you can buy and go way into the weeds or you could find a YouTube video that is, you know, explains it in much more depth. And so I, I tried to write the intro content to give you the idea to you, the reader, give you that idea of what the tool is and what the value is. So then when you're thinking about your own business and how you could make it better, you've got this idea now that you, you read about in the book, which is a value stream map or whatever, right? R- whichever tool. And so I tried to dumb it down to being somewhat simple um, as opposed to going into all the technical weeds of like, you know, all the measurements you might take or what tax time is, right? Some of those things are defined, but they're not explored in a ton of depth. Okay. I mean, that all makes sense, right? Kind of instead of having this be the comprehensive textbook, it's more of a gateway towards, hey, this is what XYZ thing is, a little bit about it. And of course, if you want to learn more, there is the entire vastness of the internet where you can learn more. There is. And that's kind of what the thesis was, I think. And, you know, the title I ended up with, right, you know, a pocket guide is, is mm-hmm. I think intended to say like, Hey, this is kind of a short snapshot. This is the, you know, the, the gateway, like you said, I like that term. Uh, and ultimately I think a lot of these things get read on your phone at this point, right. Or maybe it's a tablet. It's, it's literally a thing that lives in your pocket. And so <laughs> if you're sitting in a meeting someday or you're sitting at work, like, man, I want to make this better, but I don't know where to start. Okay. Well, like let's scroll through this. And I mean, you can even just look at the chapter titles and be like, okay, this thing's about quality. That's not what I need right now. This one's about people. Great. Let's read that one. Um, right. So it's intended to be, you know, the, the gateway, right. I'm just going to start using that. I like that term. I don't think I've ever even thought about it, but exactly what it is. 
Yeah, still for sure. Like <laughs> two, two, two last things I'm very curious about. So I like, I know people have like read it and says, have you gotten any like feedback of like people actually implementing the things you learn in the book in their business? Yeah. So I think, um, the, yeah, you know, maybe this is cause I'm my own harshest critic. I think part of the subtitle is, uh, you know, tools for improving life and business. And the first comment that comes to mind is someone wrote on like the KDP or the Amazon reviews that they were like, this doesn't really help with life, but it helps with business. <laughs> Um, and it's fair right the book really is more focused on business and i think that you know the reason i included life in the title is because like okay if you improve your day job and you're not carrying stress home at the end of the day then like that's probably a win um the the truth is though like i I, i've probably sold a hundred copies maybe between amazon and gumroad and i've not gotten any specific feedback i do know um there's a guy in Colorado that works in this oil barn where they basically take safflower seeds, they crush them up and make safflower oil that they can use to uh, either power farm equipment like tractors and stuff, or they will sell it into um, like high volume kitchens, like at a, at a university or something like that, where they're going to fry food a lot. And so they can use safflower oil to fry up whatever food in like a college cafeteria kind of thing. Uh, and I had a, you know, a somewhat long email back and forth with him, just kind of going through what some of the tools were. And, you know, I think my email address is in the book because, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not Lee Child. I'm not like JK Rowling. I'm not selling 20 million of these. <laughs> um, and so I think he got a lot out of it because he had kind of a manufacturing background, but not a, um, you know, not necessarily the business side of things. And, and so we got to talk through some of the ways you can basically set up you know, the manufacturing process to make sure that like, you know, the seeds come in, they're cleaned, they're processed. They just go through a simple stage of steps as opposed to like, you know, a haphazard arrangement of equipment where maybe, you know, the seeds come in one area and you got to carry them to the other side of the barn to clean them and carry them back across the barn again to process them and then carry them back across the barn again to ship them out. Like, you know, we got to talk through some of those things to just like, how do you set these steps up in a, you know, a linear fashion to like, have it all flow through and just have it be smooth. Um, uh, you know, we never got to do a follow up. I never asked him after the fact, like, do you make more money now? Like, I don't know, <laughs> but, but ultimately I think if you can smooth out some processes, there's certainly, um, rewards that will come out of that. Huh. And that's a pretty cool. Like having someone like reach out, even, okay, sure. A hundred copies is not as much as like JK Rowling, but I mean, still something to be like very proud of. Like that is, like I would love to make a book and sell even one copy. Like, that, that, like congratulations! Yeah, um, thank you. Well, let's do it. You know, let me know what you want to write. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be the, um, you know, the the little clippy if I need to. I'll send you an email every day or something and just say, hey, what'd you do? Did you write? Did I write? Right, right. One, one last thing. I, out of all the things in your book, I'm not saying give away your book, but I'm like, what's like the one like main. Th- takeaway you you would think is kind of like valuable for people to you know at least you know kind of like a free snippet if if you may yeah i think you know maybe there's a couple um so i think in general um there's this thing in business where you run into problems and you think to yourself like oh my god this is crazy has anyone ever dealt with this and chances are the answer is yes. Somebody has dealt with your problem before and they've probably solved your problem before. And so that I think is one of the first things to realize is like, there's probably a tool out there for you to figure out or for you to use or for you to implement. And it's not necessarily an industrial engineering tool, right? It could be like an AI and automation. It could be like a software. There's, there's any number of ways you can solve problems. Right. But um, generally speaking, if you run into some issue at work or with a business, there's probably a tool out there if you start looking for it. Um, I think one of my favorite things that that I threw in here is I'll just read it off. Um, is this idea from Taiichi Ono that he he really called the ten precepts to think, act, and win. And so this is basically a list of ten rules he came up with that you know, I, you know as the story goes, he kept on his desk and gave out to all these other engineers and leaders at Toyota. But um, I'll just read this. Um, So the first is that you're a cost and reduce waste. And so really what that means is like, figure out how to do your own stuff better, right? Like before you try to improve the business, like 
focus on you, right? <laughs> the, um, the second precept here is say that I can do it and you've got to try before you do anything else, right? So when you come into a problem, instead of being like, ah, oh, I can't fix this. Maybe I'll just call Edwin. Maybe he can fix this. Like, no, stop. Like, just do something. The third thing is here is that the actual workplace is, is the teacher. And when you actually go into the workplace, it's where you can get a lot of the answers. And the way this was intended, you know, this is a manufacturing facility. And a lot of times in a big business, you've got an executive in an office somewhere and a manufacturing team somewhere else. And the executives are trying to solve a problem for manufacturing. But the point he's making here is like, go to the source of the problem and go figure it out because you'll you'll probably see what you need to see. And from there, you can come up with an answer. And so less applicable in non-manufacturing settings. Um, but I think it's a good thing to keep in mind is like going to the source of the problem. Right. The fourth precept on this list is that doing something, like just do something immediately. Uh, starting something right now is the only way to win is, is what he's written here. And, and so again, this comes back to this, like, don't think about it. Don't say, Hey, I'm going to improve this tomorrow, next year. This is on my 10 year plan. Like, no, it's right now. If you're serious about this, it's right now. This comes back to one of the things that we talked about a little bit earlier, but you know, his fifth precept here is once you start something preserve, don't give up until you finish it. And so whether it's consistency or, or anything else, uh, I think that's one that kind of applies everywhere. The sixth one here is explain difficult things in an easy to understand manner and then repeat the things that are easy to understand. And so, again, if you think about a big business environment where, you know, there might be some corporate suit who thinks, okay, return on investment here is some percentage, or we're looking at this margin of some thing, you, you, you bake in all these accounting terms that you need to then take to someone else and say, hey, based on the productivity here and the output here, our ROI is not what we need it to be. Like, that's the wrong way to communicate a lot of times. The, the right way to communicate is like, hey, we're trying to figure out how to have more of these at the end of the day. Do you think we could create a process that leads to more of these widgets being created every day, right? Just like break things down. And then once you come up with something, like just talk about it all the time, right? Increased output, um, hmm. you know, more consistent colors, right? We need the panel gaps on our Tesla Cybertruck to match, not be like mismatch, right? Like come up with a simple term and just repeat it. Um, you actually see that play out in marketing all the time too, right? Like just do it, right? Pretty simple, right? The, the Nike built their entire brand off that. Just do it. <laughs> right. Um, right. The, the seventh thing on this list is that waste is hidden. Don't hide it. Make your problems visible. Uh, right. So in someone's house, you've maybe seen this happen. They sweep the, you know, a little bit of crap on the floor under the rug. And they kind of let it just sit there. Like, yeah, whatever. It's under the rug. We don't need to think about it. Uh, Right. In, in any business, you run into similar problems where people are like, oh, you know what? That was kind of an anomaly. Like, I'll just I'll ignore it. Maybe it won't come up again. Right. But like when you run into any kind of a problem, like talk about it, get it out there, figure out what you need to do about it. Uh, the eighth one here is that valueless motions are equal to shortening one's life. So valueless motions are equal to shortening one's life. And that's a heavy statement <laughs> the the point that he's making though or basically like what he's saying and what he was meant by this um again to my understanding is that if you spend your time doing stuff you don't like if you spend your time doing stuff you hate if you spend your time doing the wrong thing you're gonna like you're not gonna enjoy it you're gonna hate it and so you know over the course of someone's 80 90 100 year life if you spend a lot of time doing stuff you dislike or stuff that's wasteful or stuff that's like the wrong thing it's basically just like, it's taking life out of your years. It's, it's, it's not literally going to like kill you tomorrow. He's not saying like, Hey, if you have a job you dislike, you're going to die. That's not the point, <laughs> right? The point is that when you're wasting your time, your effort, your, you know, the, your brain capacity, when you're wasting that, like, you're just not going to enjoy it. And so figuring out ways to solve the problems that matter to you to, to do the right things, like, it's just such a, such a big deal. Um, the ninth one here, re-improve what was improved for further improvement, um, right. Kind of this cycle here, but like, it's this continuous improvement idea. Um, you know, I think I want to say it was Maya Angelou has a quote that's similar to this. That's like, do the best you can. And when you know better, do better. 
something along those lines. It's kind of the same message, right? Um, and then the last thing on this list, wisdom is given equally to everybody. The point is whether one can exercise it. So this gets back to some classic management consulting idea, right? It's, it's easy to have ideas. It's easy to tell somebody how to be better, do something better, but it's really hard to execute. Right. And, and so you can give the wisdom out to everybody. You can tell everybody the thing, but do they do something with it? Like the, it, it's the action. It's the, um, it's the execution. That's what matters. Hmm. Right. I think though, like those, like, in the, in the top is like more business as it went down. I was like, okay, this is, this is really deep and less about business and more about life. I, I just thought that was really, really interesting. Like, like kind of like listening to all of those I got once and just thinking about that. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if you've got those things in the back of your head, right. You know, it's my responsibility to make myself as good as possible. I, you know, I want to reduce waste. I want to stop wasting time. I want to, you know, start the project now like when you keep all those things in mind and then the work starts to come naturally because you're like okay if i'm if i know i'm dedicated to this problem or solving this thing or trying to make this team function better then you'll figure it out right you'll find the resources you'll pick up the right book you'll find the person who is the expert like if you're persevering on some path you will get there right and, and that i think is an important thing to like keep in mind right it's it can be can feel like getting kicked in the teeth sometimes when you start a project and you're six years into it and you're like, Oh God, I can't believe this isn't over yet. Like, uh, it's, but you know, that perseverance thing I think is big and, um, honestly, probably something I need to do more of. Yeah. I mean, I would say I would argue most people probably need to do more of in perseverance, especially <laughs> in this day and age. But, you know, with that being said, we are kind of like coming to time. Um, if you have like any last things, uh, anything else any one piece of advice you'd give to like all businesses in order to make them better yeah I, um you know it's hard to generalize because everybody probably has something but i think um you know commit to continuous improvement i, I think is maybe the, the general thing i could throw out there right just commit to getting as good as possible um I'd say that's probably the first thing, you know, the last thoughts, like I love to talk about these things. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm not cre incredibly active there. I think I made this account in like 2009 or something and it's a relatively small thing, but, uh, you know, if you look up Quinn underscore Hanson 22, you'll see me, the background is the, like the book. And so you'll, you'll know it's me. Uh, you know, I'm happy to talk to people about anything, right? If, if they have questions about how to, how do they get this implemented at work? What do they need to know, right? If they want to talk about anything from the book, like I'm happy to talk to anybody. Awesome. I'll make sure to link all your socials down below. And yeah, that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much, Quinn, for taking time out of your day. I know your time is valuable. Um, and yeah, hope to see yeah. you guys on the next episode of the Pathmakers podcast. And thank you so much. Thanks, Edwin. Good time. Thank you.